Hello. Hi. I do this to my students all the time. They're like, what? Hi. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming to our show. Um, if you did not receive a ticket for the raffle, can you raise your hand? <coughs> OK. A couple of people. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm very excited to have this um, showcase here at, South, at Southwestern at Mesa College because it's something that I think is really important for us to hear these stories from um, our veteran writers. Um, I was able to get a grant from the San Diego uh, Mesa College Foundation, which I was very happy about. So it's been really nice to be able to work with these writers. And what did happen to that? Did we set up a fire? <laughs> Did we? It's not me. All right, never mind. <laughs> Did you do it? Was that, yeah, was that okay? Oh. Should we? I don't know. Yeah. Are we supposed to evacuate? We're just that time. Yeah. Um, so I've been working with Justin Hudnall for a while now with his organization called So Say We All. Um, we have this showcase called BAMP, and uh, what we do is we have writers tell their true stories, and the, we just had one last Thursday, which was about um, from our students. Some of you were here? Yes, 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 it's very exciting, right? Yay! So tonight you get to hear veteran writers, um, and I'm actually going to just turn this over to my honors student, Dylan Hardy, and he can tell you a little bit more about, you know, why this is really important to bring to the campus and what we're trying to do with veterans and veteran writers and just writing in general. Yay, Dylan! Thank you, Jennifer, for being so small. Uh, I just came here for the applause, so thank you. Uh, no, anyway, so like she said, my name is Dylan. Aside from being uh, her honor student, I'm the vice president of the Student Veterans Organization here at San Diego Mesa College. Uh, so I just want to say uh, thanks for so say we all for coming out here. Uh, art, writing, and expression, you know, that's why we're here tonight. Something funny happens when you put a, a bunch of veterans in a room together. Uh, aside, from, aside, from, aside from the smell and all of us uh, resorting to the mentality of a three-year-old, uh, we have this connection that a lot of people don't understand. It's hard to understand if you haven't been in the service and you haven't served. Uh, but I like to explain it as it's where I grew up. You see, the average age of your Army and Navy personnel, about 18% of the Army and Navy is 21 and 18-year-olds. Uh, in the Marine Corps, 18 to 21-year-olds represent 37% of their constituents. That's a lot of young people. Uh, for me personally, I signed my papers to join the U.S. Navy when I was 17. A month after I turned 18 in August, I was in boot camp. And in that January, I was on a six-month deployment to the Middle East in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, <laughs> I came in as a young 18-year-old, or 17, 18, uh, working aviation and ordnance. My job was bomb assembly. Uh, before I knew it, I was assigned to a night crew assembling thousands of tons of ordnance that would be used to support our ground troops in Iraq. Uh, I like to say that the veteran family is a family not by shared blood, but by the sharing of bloodshed. Uh, we've been to war together. We've gotten drunk together in the sandbox in Jabali, Dubai, listening to Garth Brooks' alcohol. All of it to... <laughs> All of it to get back on the ship the next day, to go 40 days at sea, working 14 hours a day, seven days a week at the age of 18. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, so what I like about So Say We All is that they're all about letting veterans and letting individuals tell their stories and letting them tell them in ways that they might not get the opportunity to do so if they were to do it on their own. Uh, so for those of you that are vets, I, uh, I'm glad you're here to reminisce with us. For those of you that aren't, uh, I hope you get a little bit of the insight even just a little bit to our mentality and the kind of things that we went through. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Justin Hudnall, the executive director of So Say We All. Give it up for honored student, Bill and Hardy. When I met him, he certainly can drink like an honored student. I don't remember. <laughs> Case in point, but he lives. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Hudnall. I am the executive director of So Say We All, which is a local nonprofit literary arts organization. I founded it in 2009 when I myself came home from a deployment with the UN in South Sudan. And our mission is to help people tell their stories and tell them better. And that's all people. Any public, all of our programming is open to the public, accessible to everybody, completely free of charge from our creative writing workshops to our BAMP showcase to our storytelling shows. We want you to get involved. We think the more t people are talking to each other and listening, the better life is, the stronger our communities are. 
And on top of that, we also have these outreach programs for populations that we feel have been talked about more than heard from. Everybody can remember that experience as a child being in a room with their parents or adults and they're talking about you like you're not there. And then in that is not obviously a very nice feeling. And it's even worse when you're an adult. And so we've worked with many, many groups, but I think our largest and the one that's closest to my heart is our veterans outreach program. Uh, it has grown from a modest group of veteran writers uh, in a room workshopping their pieces together to a performance series, which is part of what you're watching today, a published book on, this, on the subject of uh, coming home and reintegrating into civilian life, which is in the back uh, for only $50 <coughs> if anybody wants to buy nine copies. That's awesome. It goes to a great cause. And a show on KPBS uh, by the same name, Incoming, which is coming back on the air, the radio on Memorial Day. I'm playing hour-long episodes every weekend for several months until they turn the power off on me because I love this show and I love doing it. Um, I write scripts. I'm like, why? And I think I need to prove to you that I prepared. I got this. Anyway, anyway. anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, I... I love working with the Veteran Writers Division just because it's one of the most diverse groups of people I've ever gotten to work with in one room all the time. It's given me the opportunity to work with the saltiest Marine Corps gunnery sergeant who incidentally will text me at 11 p.m. like a 16-year-old asking me if I liked his latest poem. Uh, to young men and women who are still rocking awkward haircuts like many I see who are out there in the audience today and haven't gotten fat yet. So welcome home. It looks fresh. Um, but uh, there's two caveats I want to put out there, and it's only because I have so many conversations about the Veteran Writers Program that this pops up a lot. So I'm just going to lay it out there. The first caveat about this program and anything else we do with storytelling is that it's not therapy. You ever meet a happy writer who was good? Exactly. It's not therapy. It's cathartic maybe sometimes, but it's not therapeutic. They're artists. Full stop who happen to also be veterans. That's how we like to treat them. That's how we hope you watch them as well. Because obviously, however long, whether you're in for 20 or for two years, it's a label that stays with you the rest of your life, but it's not defining the rest of your life. So what we feel like the value of this program really accomplishes is less than, I think the number is around 0.4% of the population serves in the military at any given time now, which is an incredibly small percentage to carry such a huge burden. And I think that it creates a lot of problems, not just for veterans, but for all civilians who know that there's this 16-year-long war going on, and they look out their window, and they see a Hardee's. <laughs> they see no trace of it here. That's got to do something to your head, right? That's got to make you a little bit crazy. So if it's therapeutic for anybody, we hope it's therapy for civilians so that they know what their military is doing and who their military is. I grew up here in the 1980s when it was Top Gun, and uh, every Marine I met reminded me of Biff from Back to the Future. I just thought they all wanted to pants me and beat me up. And that guy's out there. But since working with this division, I mean, Frank's one of them, but I've gone on to meet a lot of incredibly soulful people who have shocked and astounded me every turn. So I'm looking forward to introducing you to, to six of those performers today. Uh, now, half of the performers you're going to see wrote on the theme of our first book, Homecoming. And then the other half are writing for our future book, which we're passing up pamphlets today, hoping that if there's any vets, interpreters who worked with the military, or family, spouses, lovers of veterans who want to contribute to it, our next theme is sex, drugs, and Copenhagen. Because if as anyone who's been in the military knows, the vast majority of your time is spent bored off your ass. And so we decided to put out a call for stories that are all about the coping mechanisms utilized to survive that experience, the hardship, the trauma, and the boredom, both in service and returning to civilian life. Uh, and some of those stories, as you're going to see today, are really fucking wild. Really not going to play on the radio a lot of these stories. It would just be like, it's like playing, a, it would just be like playing the filthiest rap song, just all bleeps. Um, but we wanted to share these with you because one of the things that kind of ticks me off is that and maybe I've even accidentally contributed to it, is this perception that all veterans are damaged, right? There's three stereotypes you only see in Hollywood, and that's the hero, the victim, or the villain. And I've never met a hero. I've seen people do heroic acts, but that's not a real thing. That's a literary device. And so we wanted to go plumb the depths of the most interesting, uh, dangerous, hard-to-speak-about moments just to give you an insight into how human the military really is. And so our first performer, 
who's definitely one of the most human women I've ever met in my life. She's one of my oldest friends, uh, one of my first artists that I made contact with when I started Sissy Wheel back in 2009. Uh, please put your hands together as I look at my witty intro here. Uh, Navy Nuke, comedian, musician, and now the Veterans Administration shit stirrer on the inside. Welcome, Allison Gill. song about 10 years ago. I don't play it anymore as a comedian, but it was an important song that had to be written, and we'll get into that later. But first, booze. I give booze one star. Booze wasn't ever the best way for me to deal with trauma, though I understand the mechanism. Drink until your brain stops feeding you bad information about yourself. I was one of the first women ever in the nuke program in the Navy. But being one of four women on a base with over 600 men has its drawbacks. After only about a month, I was raped by a shipmate. Everyone, including myself, did a bang-up job of covering the whole thing up. The military police officer I tried to report the rape to had convinced me that the whole thing was my fault by shaming me into believing I should have known better than to be there. I should have been smarter than to have worn what I wore or to have flirted with anyone. Despite having been drugged and left bleeding, I chalked it up to a series of bad decisions on my part. I repeated my mantra to myself over and over again. You shouldn't have been there. That was really stupid of you. You can't give men a reason to take advantage of you like that, or they will. You can't blame them for that. In fact, I learned the narrative so well, and I was so convinced of my own mea culpa, that years later, when my best friend was raped, I found myself saying the same things to her. You shouldn't have been drinking. You shouldn't have flirted with him. You put yourself in that situation. It's probably one of the hardest behaviors I've had to reconcile. And to this day, I still blame myself for that. Please note, if you hear a woman victim blaming another woman, she's likely a rape survivor. 
Once my mind had its narrative, drinking was the best way to prevent any dissidents from piping up with truth. I would find myself drinking with classmates during any free time we had. We even formed a club centered on drinking called Beta Epsilon Chi, B-E-X. Get it? <laughs> Bex. I was awarded the position of Omega Chi, or official challenger, meaning you would have to beat me in a beer chugging contest in order to be inducted into the group because I could make a pint disappear in under two seconds. I still can, by the way. I would drink every night after mandatory study hours. I would drink so much I could barely keep it down during the two-mile run every day at 4.30 in the morning, but so many people were bu puking during the morning run that it seemed totes normal. <laughs> I unknowingly drank to forget that I was violated. I drank to maintain the narrative that it wasn't rape and that I was an idiot. And then I drank some more to mask the feeling of being an idiot. In the years following my discharge from the Navy, I drank my way into two DUIs, two car accidents, depression, divorce, and a nice 40 pounds. I've learned a lot over the years about booze, having used it as a survival tool for over a decade. Aside from knowing that I like good whiskey, craft beer, and Pinot Noir, I've learned that booze is a super temporary solution that does far more harm than good. Brains are amazing things in that they don't stop working on your behalf, but you can only keep them quiet for so long. There's an old joke about how to get a flautist and a guitar player in tune, and the answer is to shoot the flautist. <laughs> Self-medicating in an attempt to create harmony between the self and the mind is the equivalent of shooting the flautist. More sex. <laughs> I give the more sex solution three stars. I would give having more sex as a coping mechanism one star if it weren't for the basic enjoyable nature of the act. <laughs> Using sex to cope is the same mechanism as an eating disorder. It's about control. A person with bulimia can't control themselves during a binge, but they can take control of their weight and body by purging. Those with anorexia or nervosa compensate for a lack of power over their lives by taking power over food. Controlling something amidst chaos is the brain's way of helping you feel like not killing yourself. Having all sorts of sex at my own discretion and on my own terms was how I maintained a sense of control over my body. It was a preemptive strike. I think my brain was determined to have sex with people before they could rape us, thereby controlling the narrative. This behavior began nearly immediately when I agreed to sleep with an instructor at Navy Nuke School in exchange for a grade. Ironically, he was my heat transfer and fluid flow instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Using sex to cope continued so long that the sex became a chore, making any kind of healthy relationship impossible. During the 15 years following the rape, I was not able to link up sex and love in any way. Sex became a tool. If I was in a relationship, I craved affection until it crossed that imaginary line that I had drawn between I care about you and I want to have sex with you now. Once that point was reached, I would either bow out or check out. The men in my life could only handle that kind of response for so long. The loneliness compounded with the trauma caused depression, and now I had two flautists to keep quiet. Overachieving. <laughs> Four enthusiastic stars for being an overachiever. Overachieving is the only coping mechanism that has never stopped for me. One of the best ways to keep your brain quiet is to keep it busy with other activities. Sometimes your brain does you a solid and chooses activities that improve your life. After the rape, I dove into my schoolwork. I studied until midnight every night of the week, and I raised my grade from a 2.8 to a 4.0. I realized I could control the outcome of school by getting good grades, and I haven't stopped since. I graduated nuke school with a perfect grade, and despite that drinking problem and depression, crippling anxiety, and divorce, I finished my bachelor's, then an MBA, and today I turned in my dissertation for my PhD. <laughs> the reason I don't give overachieving five stars is because this can actually backfire. When I filed my claim for PTSD with the Department of Veterans Affairs, my claim was denied three times over five and a half years. The VA said I couldn't prove that the rape had happened. Of course you can't prove it. I did a masterful job of covering it up. I didn't report my rape. I tried. I stumbled into the police station at 5 a.m. wearing a blanket and bleeding and tried to tell them I had been raped. 
Aside from convincing me the rape was my fault, they threatened me with the consequences of filing a false report. They said I would be court-martialed, that I would lose my school and my rank. They told me I would lose all my benefits, including my GI Bill, and probably be dishonorably discharged. They said I could be charged with adultery because my rapist was married. And I may even get a big chicken dinner. That's a bad conduct discharge to the acronymically challenged. I was terrified, so of course I didn't report it. When I reported to sick call, I told them I had fallen down. I also asked for birth control because I heard you could take a bunch at once and prevent pregnancy. Here's the problem with keeping it all, ex all a secret. When you file a claim for military sexual trauma, there's no proof. The VA will accuse you of making the whole thing up and insist your PTS comes from something that happened prior to your service. The denied claims felt more traumatizing than the actual assault, and they dragged it out over years. But one of the pieces of proof the VA offered to support their assertion that I was never raped was that after the attack, my grades got better. No one's grades get better after a traumatic event, they said. So doing well can backfire when you're trying to prove you're not doing well. Something to keep in mind. Music. Four stars. I would give music five stars, but I've heard some of my songs, you guys. <laughs> Music is an amazing coping mechanism, though. Like art and poetry, you never know what it's about until you're ready for it to make sense. I know you know the drill. You're in a trance-like state, writing a song or painting a picture, and once it's all done, you have absolutely zero idea what the fuck it means. <laughs> then later, when it clicks, you can't believe you didn't see it, because it's so obvious. For example, I wrote the following. You squeeze the light from me like a firefly on a warm July night scrawling out your declarations on your driveway with my insides. You stole my sex and rode me all the way to self-esteem, all the while filling me up with your insecurities. I wrote that, and I didn't know why. <laughs> my brain attributed it to an ex-boyfriend. That's how deeply I buried the incident. My heart was desperately trying to tell my brain that we had been raped and that we needed help. But my brain decided compartmentalization was a better idea and simply failed to acknowledge it. That's how far the denial and self-blame goes. So deep, I couldn't recognize the messages in bottles my heart was sending to my brain in songs. So deep that I would victim blame my best friend. I didn't realize I was raped until about 17 years after it happened. Not because it wasn't violent or glaringly obvious, but because my brain had done such an amazing job of protecting me from that information. I got out of the military in 1996. I had my first major panic attack in 2002. In 2004, I had a panic attack that was so bad, I drove myself to the VA thinking I was having a heart attack. That's when they started asking me about my time in the military and if I had ever experienced anything traumatic. My canned answer was always, no, I served under Clinton. We just read books. <laughs> It wasn't until 2007 when the VA began asking everyone with PTS symptoms if they had been sexually assaulted. I said no when they asked me at first, because you know, that night was a bad decision on my part. But the panic attacks kept coming. I keep going to the VA, and they keep asking me if I was raped. Finally, I told a therapist the story of that night, how I'd been drinking and flirting and playing guitar, how we'd played cards, how I blacked out and woke up without my clothes and bleeding how I told him that I didn't want to do that, and how he said to me, aw, are you going to cry rape? How I had tried to report it, but the master at arms had talked some sense into me. So that's not rape, right? I asked. I began cognitive behavioral therapy. And at about two years, the lights came all the way on. I was in a session where I was instructed to speak to an empty chair, as though it were my attacker. I thought this was a little odd, considering I had played such a big role in my rape that I really should be yelling at myself. I played along, though, and the floodgates opened almost immediately. The anger I had wrapped up and hidden so well started boiling over. The anger I had at this man for ruining my life, causing my divorce, destroying my trust in others, wrecking my relationships, preventing me from having a family. I was a volcano that day, sobbing and panting and throwing things at that chair. And for the first time, I was externalizing what had happened to me. My brain was no longer in denial. The jig was up. But music, music let me tell my secrets without having to acknowledge them. Being able to get it out of me and into the world helped immeasurably. 
Yoga. Yoga gets five stars. And I'm not going to talk about yoga too much because people want to hear about yoga like they want to hear about CrossFit and your gluten-free diets. <laughs> it's true. I will say this. The word yoga comes from Sanskrit, meaning to join or to yoke. Remembering that traumatic events drive a wedge between the mind and the body, mitigating that duality with yoga is a very powerful way to heal yourself. Using asanas or poses, <clears throat> your tangible and intangible selves learn to work together until they eventually like each other again. I believe yoga is the best non-medical treatment for PTS, and I'm working daily to try to get the VA to pay for it instead of the mountains of antipsychotics, SSRIs, MAOIs, benzodiazepines, and antidepressants that are often combined with pain medications, rendering people flatly affected, comatose, and sometimes dead. Yoga is the answer. Comedy. Five stars, man. There's nothing like comedy in the wide universe. The best part is that I never meant to become a comedian. I was a musician, a serious musician, a coffeehouse feminist, angry, Lilith Fair, minor chord, pay attention to me musician. <laughs> I had been playing angry girl music in bars and theaters and festivals since I was in college, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get the people at the bar to be quiet and listen to me. <laughs> But that all changed one night in 2004. I was at 4th and B to see the Flaming Lips, and Liz Fair was opening. That's kind of a weird combo. And when Liz Fair was on stage, most of the Flaming Lips fans were just ignoring her. I knew exactly how she felt. But then she started singing a song called Hot White Cum. <laughs> and the whole place stopped and turned and looked to stage, and then, like a needle was coming off a record. You could see in the furrowed brows and confused looks of the patrons asking themselves, did she just say hot white cum? <laughs> Until the chorus came again, and yes, she did in fact say hot white cum. And everybody was listening now just to see what the hell she was going to say next. And I realized what I had to do. I had to write songs about drinking and fucking. <laughs> right. I immediately started an imaginary band with two of my real friends called the Crooked Bush. <laughs> <laughs> we gave ourselves names. My friend Joelle was Tammy Mams. I was Relly, Relly Wide Legs. <laughs> Heather was Booty Buffet. We called our first album Giraffe Deep Throat. <laughs> I wrote the first song called The Alcohol Induced Mating Ritual, which is the song I played for you at the opening of this reading. <clears throat> In a comedy setting, that title is hilarious. On a serious note, can you see where I got the idea? The room might be spinning, but we'll go on sinning. I'm going to tell you why, because the sex would be better if we were both sober, but I don't think I'd fuck you if I was. Funny. And relatable. <laughs> then came the song called There's No Such Thing as Whiskey Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by Girls Are More Fun to Fuck When We're Drunk. <laughs> which teaches us when girls get drunk, we have low inhibitions, and you can put us into 10 new positions. I'll put on my leather, and if that ain't enough, buy me two more shots, I'll let you put it in my butt. <laughs> Hilarious, right? That's how my brain coped, you guys. Writing songs about rape that I could laugh at for years before I even knew I had ever been raped. Prepping me for the big reveal with humor. I don't play those songs anymore, but I wouldn't be here without them. One night after getting off stage at a pub playing a mix of my songs and cover songs, a friend approached me and said, I have this show this weekend at the Comedy Store. You should totally be on it. To which I said, but I'm not a comedian. To which he said, uh, yeah, you are. So I got on stage for three minutes and played one song, and they were all paying attention, you guys. So I've been writing jokes ever since. A lot of my jokes are about sex, drinking, and rape, because that's what comedians do. We take our pain, and we entertain you with it. I defend rape jokes when I hear them, but they have to be funny. I think that's the general rule of comedy. You can talk about anything you want, but it has to be funnier than it is offensive. Otherwise, it's just offensive. Laughing at your own sadness is a great way to vanquish it. Repeating it over and over again is like a weird kind of exposure therapy. I have a song lyric that says, I feel a little better every time the song is sung. And I think that's real. Laughter kept me alive during those years before I knew what, was, what I was up against. And making people laugh with your own problems is cathartic. 
So there's this guy I was dating, and he knew I was into kinky sex, so he asked me if I wanted to try any rape fantasies. I was like, no. And he goes, that's the spirit. <laughs> Give it up for Allison Gilligan. So your next performer was introduced to me by his Grossmont College creative writing instructor, just like many of you have been introduced, well, should be introduced to me soon by your creative writing instructors if you're in such a class. And she wrote me an email. She said, I got this guy. He's got a live wire of a voice, and it needs to be heard, and that is absolutely proven the case. So welcome, Joshua Galloway. I stand in line at the Anchorage Post Office, a thousand people in front of me. We serpentine around counters and shelves, stacked full of boxes, envelopes, cardstock, watermark stationery, and collector edition stamps adorned with Christmas bells, dreidels, antique cars, movie scenes, and influential women throughout history. We shuffle on, one foot at a time, prisoners in a chain gang. I came here directly after work in an attempt to save some time. I immediately regret this decision, as I can feel all the eyes of the customers falling upon me, sizing me up in my uniform from head to toe. Some look at me in disgust and turn away. Oddly, this doesn't bother me. Some look at me and give me a quick smile or a nod, and I feel myself starting to have a mini panic attack. I wish I had a volume. I inhale deeply through my nose and pinch with a bridge, pitch it on the bridge with my thumb and index finger in my right hand. Hey buddy, you okay? The words come from behind me and fill me with a nameless dread. Please, please don't be talking to me. I turn, a short pudgy old man stands behind me wearing a gigantic fur-lined parka, mostly bald, sporty a bad comb over and round Coke bottle spectacles that magnify his oil black eyes. He has the unmistakable looks of an Alaskan native with his olive skin, flat forehead, and thin mustache that only forms in the corners of his mouth. His breath is rank with cheap gin. He has a genuine look of concern smeared across his face. I stare at him for a measured minute before he inquires again. You okay, buddy? His words seem foreign. What the hell are you asking me? What do you want? Why can't you just mind your own goddamn business and leave me alone? He waves his hand in front of my face as if to break my trance. Are you all right? I'm, I, I'm fine. I finally sputter out, forcing a half smile. I turn back around. I feel a tap on my shoulder. A chill shoots down my spine and my stomach churns. I think I may throw up. I can already taste bile in the back of my mouth. I take another deep breath, hold it in, close my eyes, tighter this time. Oh God, go away. I take a moment before turning to face him again. Yes? I inquire, deliberately drawing out the word in an attempt to show frustration, get the old man to back off. It's lost on him, and he continues. You sure you was okay? You sweat pretty good. What? I'm utterly confused. Sweat, he says, pointing to my forehead. I feel my brow, and it comes back soaked in perspiration. I get like this in crowds of people. A little warm, I guess. Embarrassed at having someone notice and bring attention to it. Really? I'm freezing. Ain't you freezing? He asks the girl in line behind him, a pretty blonde in a blue dress and green parka that doesn't match. She nods in agreement and studies my pale, sweat-coated face. I guess I'm just warm-blooded, I offer. What do you care anyway, you son of a bitch? <laughs> Maybe he's getting sick. I'm fine, really. Piss off. You should see a doctor. Yeah, I'll do that, I assure him, making no attempt to mask my sarcasm. I turn and face forward once more and shuffle up a couple of feet. Anybody in here a doctor? He blurts out from behind me. I'm starting to shake. Everyone turns to look. My chest tightens. The room is spinning. My vision tunnels. I'm fine, I bark. The words come out sounding much harsher than I intended. The old man has a shocked expression, as though someone had just delivered the news that his dog had died. I think to myself, eh, at least now maybe you'll leave me alone. I take comfort in the thought and allow myself a moment of relaxation. It's short-lived, however, as I hear the dreaded words come from behind me. 
So, you was overseas, yeah? I cringe. My guts flip-flop inside me, and a gruesome, bubbling sensation comes from my bowels. Please don't let me shit myself. I turn and face the old man once more, look at the gigantic, magnified eyes, and reply flatly, yeah, I was. And I turn around again. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Begins playing over the speakers. I hate Christmas music. The upbeat, cheerful tones with their messages of love, hope, and forgiveness. It's all bullshit. How did I not notice this when I first came in here? If I had, I would have turned and left right then and there and could have avoided this entire fiasco. I consider leaving now, but I've been shuffling along in this line now for 45 minutes, and there's only three more customers waiting in front of me. Still, it's tempting. Well, he continues, let me just be the first to say thank you for your service and your sacrifice. <laughs> I spin around and face him. A smile spread across his stupid-looking face from ear to ear, his arm outstretched, offering a handshake. I feel delirious. I'm sure I'm starting to hyperventilate. I think maybe I'll black out. Why do they always say that? Thank you for your service and your sacrifice. What do you know about it? You don't know nothing about my sacrifice. You don't know one damn thing about me. How would you know what I've sacrificed, if anything at all? Thank you for your service, really. I wonder how many people would thank me if they knew that we killed a kid, no more than 15, his family crying in the next room as he bled out in their kitchen. Would they thank me for my service if they knew that I punched an eight-year-old square in the chest for throwing rocks at me? Would they still thank me if they knew that I walked right on by as mother pled for me to help as she clutched her dead baby, blue and limp in her arms? Would they still thank me for my service if they knew how ready I was to murder? And not just the bad guys, but anyone who provided me with the opportunity. Would they thank me then? I felt the blood pumping through my veins, beginning to heat up. The nauseous feeling that I had was now gone. Replaced was a burning feeling in my stomach, burning out of control. I can literally feel the heat coming off of me. I want desperately to punch the old clutch right in his face, although admittedly, I don't know why. What's wrong with me? Why am I always so goddamn angry all the goddamn time? I gain just enough composure to shake the man's hand, perhaps a little too tight. I tell him, you're welcome, and thank you for your support. I offer a fake smile, but it feels stupid and forced. It's either my faux smile or my vice grip, but something has changed in the old man. His smile is gone, and instead, a look that's a mixture of fear and disgust. For a moment, I think he sees right through me. Or maybe I've been speaking out loud. I'm not sure. He's saying something to me now, but my head's spinning. I feel weak and dizzy. I shake my head, trying to gain clarity. I look once more at the old man, and his smile is back. But is that ever gone? I still can't make out what he's telling me, but he's pointing at me. Wait, no, not at me. He's pointing past me. Then suddenly, as if I've been turning the knob on a radio, finding nothing but static, and then finally finding a station, his words make sense. You're up, kid. Still slightly confused, I turn and see the, head ca see the cashier behind the counter waving me forward. I step up to the desk. The woman looks irritated. I wonder how long she's been calling me before I acknowledge her. How can I help you, sir? She asks. I respond only with a blank look, like perhaps I don't understand the question. Sir. What do you need? She asked, this time with a bit of an attitude. Still nothing. Sir, how can I help you? She says, pausing between each word as if I'm an imbecile and don't understand if you speak too quickly. I can feel the anger stoking up again deep inside. I need to mail these off, I tell her, slamming the envelopes I've had clutched in my sweaty fist down on the counter. The cashier is startled and jumps a little which makes me smile. She inspects the envelopes for a second and then asks, will you be needing insurance with you, sir? No, I say, shaking my head. Are you sure, sir, this time of the year we really do recommend, I said no, I shout at her, cutting the lady off as she speaks. Hey, buddy, you gotta take it easy. I turn to see the old man talking to me from behind me. Behind him, a sea of faces all looking at me with disproving eyes. I know you've been in line for a while, he says you got to take it easy. I feel a tidal wave of embarrassment crash over me. You're right, I tell him. I'm sorry. I turn once more to face the cashier. I apologize to her, but it's clear that it's a little too late. 
Anything else, sir? This time she's the one talking through clenched teeth. No, ma'am, that's all. I pay my bill and walk my way to the door. I'm sure she'll toss the letters until they'll never reach their intended destination. But at this point, I couldn't care less. I'm pissed off, but not at anybody else this time. I'm mad at myself for acting like an ass. I'm losing control of myself. The monster I woke inside me in Iraq is proving harder than I expected to put back to rest. I climb into my Dodge Stratus, put the keys in the ignition, but I don't turn them. I just sit there. I feel for the first hot tear run down my face, and I wipe it quickly away. But I've opened the floodgates, and the tears start pouring out. I feel so ashamed, but I can't hold them back. As the tears flow, snot begins running out my nose. I wipe my nose with the sleeve of my blouse, leaving a trail of slime. I flip the visor down to see myself through the vanity mirror, just how pitiful I look. Fuck! I scream at myself. Fuck you! You little bitch, look at you. You're so frickin' pathetic, I tell my reflection between sobs. I look out the left window and see the pretty girl in the blue dress. I'm not sure how long she's been watching, but it's obvious that she's got enough of my production to cause concern. Are you all right? She mouths. I roll down the window. I'm fine, I lie, tears still cascading down my face. Truly, I'm fine. Are you sure? She asks. You don't look fine. I start the car. I am. I'm fine, I tell her as I put the car in reverse. Thank you. Wait a minute, she hollers as she puts the car in the drive and, peels, and I peel out the icy driveway. Home is only a few blocks away, but I circle around for another hour until my tears have stopped and my cheeks have dried. I can't let my wife and boys see me like this. When I finally pull into the driveway at my apartment complex, the clock reads 7.07. I flip the visor down once more and examine my face, ensuring there's no remaining trace of tears. My eyes are still slightly bloodshot, but for the most part, you can't tell that I've been blubbering. I feel better, but deep down in my belly, I can still feel something smoldering, threatening to take flame again. Josh Galloway. All right, our next performer is a veteran of punk rock and the journalism that covers it, as much as he is of the U.S. Navy, if not more so. He produces one of the best reading series that goes on between here in San Diego and Los Angeles, Vermin on the Mount, on top of being the author of Forest of F Fortune, the only collection of short stories titled Big Lonesome You'll Ever Need to Read, and co-author of My Damage with Keith Morris of Black Fat Flag and Giving the Finger with Scott Campbell Jr. of the Discovery Channel's Deadliest Catch. I also like to thank him, of him as my personal mentor and friend. We'll see if he agrees. Uh, there's a lot of dangers that our sailors face, and Jim's going to tell you about one that uh, we might not have thought about. Welcome, Jim Rowland! Thank you very much, my uh, protege, John Malkovich. <laughs> uh, also, thank you, Dylan and Jennifer, for putting on this great event. I'd like to talk tonight about loss of innocence, and not the kind of loss that has anything to do with combat, um, not that kind of loss, but something a lot more mundane. The inevitable loss of innocence that comes when you assemble a group of young, largely uneducated, very badly trained people and leave them alone unsupervised. <laughs> that kind of loss of innocence. And I can pinpoint the exact moment when mine just disappeared. At 0400 hours on the day my life changed forever, I was standing at attention with a dozen shivering recruits inside the largest meal producing facility in the universe, awaiting orders from a gangly 19 year old sailor in a white t shirt and a paper hat. The harsh fluorescent lights seemed to reflect off a zillion stainless steel surfaces. My hands were numb, my body confused. I was groggy from lack of sleep, but thrilled to be inside. 
away from the wind whistling off Lake Michigan. I felt in that moment a fleeting happiness, happy because I wasn't freezing to death in the sub-zero cold, and fleeting because I knew I'd be on my feet and working my ass off in the galley at Great Lakes Retreat recruit training command for the next 16 hours straight. The babyface autocrat went down the ranks handing out work assignments and delivering us to our fates. Bakery, serving line, scullery, deep sink. They were the lucky ones. I was dispatched to the ovens to work with Mike, a foul-tempered brute with a complexion like wet dough and circles under his eyes that were so deep and dark he looked like he'd been up for weeks. He kept his long, greasy hair in a net. His arms were clotted with shitty tattoos. His teeth inspired nightmares. He said things like, old enough to bleed? old enough to breed. <laughs> the work was simple but dangerous. Everything was hot, slippery, or sharp. I managed to remove a hundred trays of bacon from the massive ovens, drain off the crackling grease, and stack the trays <laughs> in a rolling meat locker without burning myself. Eventually, Mike opened up started cracking jokes he'd probably told a thousand times before. I worked fast, kept my head down, and my mouth shut. After lunch, we switched from bacon to beef. It went like this. I took a tray out of the oven, speared a roast with a long fork, and placed it in a stainless steel bin. When the bin was full, I brought it to Mike, and he pushed the roast through a meat slicer. We were in a pretty good rhythm when it happened. <laughs> the blade got snagged on a piece of gristle, and the roast shot into the air and stayed airborne for several spectacular seconds before it hit the deck with a splat. Mike and I looked at that hunk of meat for a long, long time, studying it, you might say. There was a puddle where the blood had squirted out and the roast was coated with grime. Now, I was pretty sure Mike was deliberating whether or not he should put the beef back on the slicer. <laughs> and I wouldn't have said anything if that's what he wanted to do. I might have volunteered to rinse it off first, but that's it. I really didn't care one way or the other. But Mike, he had other ideas. You want to fuck it? <laughs> <laughs> it took me a moment <laughs> to process this ungodly solicitation. I thought he might be joking. I prayed that he was joking. He wasn't joking. <laughs> I'll drill a hole in it, and you can take it back to the cooler before it gets cold. What do you say? Now, I was many things. The son of a naval officer, a slacker, a punk. But I wasn't someone who did unspeakable things to inanimate objects. I wasn't a meat fucker. <laughs> At least, not yet, anyway. <laughs> Come on, he pleaded. I know you ain't getting no action in them barracks. Plenty of brown eye, though. And that's when I understood that Mike 
a federally employed wage slave in the food service sector, wasn't just offering to drill the hole, he wanted me to fuck the meat. <laughs> and in the gospel according to Mike, anyone who declined his invitation to have intercourse with a hot bloody hole and a cow carcass must be gay, which was the worst thing a sailor could be in Ronald Reagan's Navy. <laughs> I shook my head. What a shame, Mike said as he kicked the roast with the toe of his boot before picking it up and tossing it in the trash. Still warm. <laughs> we finished slicing the rest of the roast. I stacked the bins in the meat locker and wheeled them up to the serving line. When it was time for my break, I got in line and stared at all those mounds of rare roast beef. <laughs> my heart started racing and I broke into a sweat. The saltpeter the Navy supposedly put in the scrambled eggs and pancake batter wasn't working <laughs> because somewhere in the soft pink folds and shadowy dimples, was my meat friend. <laughs> the association had been made and nothing could unmake it. The meat was making me horny. <laughs> and now it will be the same for you. <laughs> the next time you're standing in line at a buffet and the server forks a glistening slab of bloody meat onto your plate, you will think of me. <laughs> you will think of Mike. You will think of our lost innocence. <laughs> Thank you. Jim Newland. That story is sponsored by Vegans of America. <laughs> our next performer is a very dangerous individual, dangerously sexy, I mean. <laughs> Let's get that out of the way. He carries a gun every day as part of his job in law enforcement. He's gay and he's black, so there's pretty much no political argument in America that everybody doesn't want him to be their best friend on. Please welcome Mr. Derek Woodford. That was unexpected. <laughs> I felt ashamed, or excuse me, I felt ashamed for crying in basic training, but it was Christmas day, and when I looked around, the, choir, the criers were the majority. Grown men logging to be with their families and significant others, but instead, stuck in basic training on Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. There were far worse places we could be, and some of us were likely to see those places with a career in the military, but I wanted to be home. I wanted to be home having a slice of my mother's pecan pie, listen to her sing Motown Christmas carols as she cooked and baked in the kitchen. A complete 180 from just a few weeks prior when I couldn't have left Cleveland soon enough. I questioned whether or not it was counterproductive to have come out to my mother to join an organization whose policy at the time was, don't ask, don't tell. I was 18, fresh out of high school, and very naive about what was socially acceptable at the time. My parents were divorced and had not been on speaking terms for years. I sat my mother down in the living room, just the two of us. My mouth felt dry and had a distinct feeling the words wouldn't come when my lips began to move. I'm gay. She cursed under her breath and just stared at me for a moment. Then came with a barrage of what I can only imagine were rhetorical questions and statements since I wasn't given time to respond. Are you sure? Have you been with a woman? A real woman. This cannot be happening. Have you prayed on it? You're gonna get AIDS. Aren't you afraid of the AIDS? In retrospect, I would have been equally surprised if she had been accepting. No more than 20 minutes later, we were driving across town to my Aunt Ellen's home. The three of us took the worn staircase to Aunt Ellen's bedroom, where we held hands at the foot of the bed, but not before she rubbed olive oil on our foreheads. The olive oil was used to symbolize purity and faith. It would be years later that I learned people actually cooked with it, because at that point, I had only seen it used in prayer. <laughs> And Ellen held both our hands and started to pray. 
Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. Give him his praise, she commanded. My mother and I repeated in unison. Thank you, Jesus. Like all the times before, Aunt Ellen was soon speaking in tongue, and then she broke the circle and laid hands on me. Yes, yes, destruction. You're headed down the path of destruction, my son. Don't let the devil lead you astray. He's a liar, a cheat, and a thief. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants your soul, she shouted. She shouted with the fiery tone of a preacher. I felt numb. She went on for several more minutes. I don't know how long we were in the bedroom praying, but when it was all over with, I was drained, confused, and more helpless than when we started. Just barely out of high school, I moved out on my own, but still spent the next couple of years being assaulted with Bible verses and looks of disappointment. Somehow, just living in the same city felt unbearable. I was the proverbial black sheep, an outcast. I decided I needed to leave. The listening process was a blur. I remember tests and plenty of paperwork. At one point, I was downtown lined up with about 30 other guys. We were all in our underwear being subjected to physicals and exams and herded around. We were barefoot and the floor was cold. Later, there were stacks of paperwork presented to me by my recruiter for signature. Most sheets were white, but occasionally I was presented with a pink or yellow form with carbon copies. One was a health questionnaire. My eyes immediately focused on the black line created by Magic Mark in order to conceal a particular question. The exact wording alludes to me, but ultimately was asking if I was a homosexual. The don't ask, don't tell policy was so new, the paperwork hadn't been changed yet. After basic training in the technical school, I was en route to my first duty station, Allison Air Force Base, the place I would live the next three years. During a layover in Anchorage, I boarded a much smaller plane than the one I arrived on. A clear sign Fairbanks didn't have quite the draw as Anchorage. I couldn't have been more of an oddity on the flight. The average age on the passengers on board was about 60, and I was the only person of color. The flight was less than an hour, just enough time to guzzle down a Dixie cup size of Coke and explain to the gray-haired gentleman sitting beside me that I was reporting to my first duty station. He thanked me for my service. As I got off the plane, the air was musky, like I smelled once before when I was at camp when I was 12 years old. The counselor said that was the smell of fresh air. I followed the crowd into the airport directly from the tarmac. We disembarked. I followed, excuse me, from the tarmac, we disembarked around. Cringing once inside, the stuffed moose, bears, and other wildlife passed off as airport decor. After checking in at the base, I used a phone in the common area to call my mother. Luckily, it was deserted. I made it here, I said. It's different. I can't believe you're in Alaska. It's so far away, she said. How are you feeling, I asked. A couple months before my departure, she was having respiratory issues and was diagnosed with lupus. I'm doing better. God is good, she said. She went from part-time saint to full-time saint. She no longer wore pants. She put her hair up in a swooped up church lady bun. I just wanted to check in. I need to get settled. Okay, I'm praying for you. We were the cable dogs. We installed and repaired telephone trunk cables, both underground and aerial. Upon my arrival to Allison, the shot was nearly completed the installation of the local area network to all the buildings on base. We were just getting the internet. Our shop maintained a force of eight to 12 people at a time, depending on the comings and goings. Most of the guys were married. There was something about Alaska that made people couple off quickly, even the young ones. At times, we worked hard. Foosball tournaments went on daily during lunch. I was only the go-to guy if a fourth player was needed and no one in a two-mile radius was available. <laughs> Dipping, chewing tobacco was another pastime of theirs, and I was warned to always check your Coke cans because there was that one time someone took a swig from the wrong can. They compared who had the loudest and smelliest farts. I declined. <laughs> they hunted the fish in their spare time. I drank and party. They knew I was different, but I hope they believed I was wasn't. In, excuse me. They knew I was different, but I hope they believed I just wasn't into crazy white people shit. Not gay. <laughs> Either way, they never treated me any worse for it. Back then, Fairbanks didn't exactly have gay bars, and the internet was barely on the scene. Long before my arrival, I had done my research, and that led me to Alaska Land, a 33-acre theme park. The park was designed to look like an authentic gold mining town from the 1920s. I walked by a general store, a life-size riverboat placed in the center of the park, a carousel, a gazebo, and a modern-day food court. It was after hours, so the park was quite deserted. This could not be the place, I thought. 
but the gay travel guide I purchased months prior said seek out the saloon. It was more of a bar space than a gay bar. During the day, it was filled with families and tourists visiting the historic park, but at night, you had the likes of me lurking around looking for others like me. The whole situation felt very clandestine and unsettling to me, which gave me the feeling of wrongdoing, like the Gestapo would bust through the door at any moment. The DJ was set up near a stage framed by a thick red velvet curtain, where I pictured a line of can-can dancers performing for grungy prospectors. <laughs> there was a typical moose head hanging on the wall, along with mining paraphernalia, and it nearly looked like your average TGI Fridays. A few tables and chairs remained on the floor while others were pushed aside for what I reasoned was to make room for dancing. No one was dancing. <laughs> Incidentally, the people in attendance very much reminded me of prospectors. Thick beards and flannels with a dress code, but nothing like the grim hipster crowd of today. They were just real Alaskan men who just happened to be gay, who didn't give a fuck about what was in fashion. They were scary to me, not intimidating necessarily, but in a, you look sort of homeless, please don't touch me sort of way. <laughs> I sat in the corner sipping my beer, wondering how I was going to make it through the next few years. I envisioned a future of celibacy, meditating, and lots of exercise. <laughs> but on one of my trips to the saloon, I met Damon. He was stationed at Fort Rain Wainwright, just on the edge of town. He was tall, lean, with a mocha complexion. I noticed him earlier talking with a couple of girls on the other side of the bar. Oh shit, another brother, he said, and yeah. introduced himself. To reasons even unknown to me, I immediately felt awkward and guarded. I was in Alaska, in the military. I hadn't done the song and dance of meeting someone in quite some time. I didn't know his game either. Often you would meet a guy at the saloon who claimed to be there for the music because apparently the saloon played the best fucking music in town. <laughs> but I figured out his game when he asked if I wanted to dance. I hesitated and looked around. Only a handful of people were bouncing around on the dance floor, and I felt as if people were already watching us. So before I could say no, he pulled me out onto the dance floor. Suddenly, I had no rhythm. I did an awkward two-step. When I had had enough, I offered to buy us a round of drinks. As I handed him his beer, I noticed the wedding ring. Oh, just a marriage of convenience, he smirked. I didn't know whether or not to believe him. It was a phrase thrown around a lot in the inner circles of military personnel. People married for money, to get out the dorms and assignments. At that moment, I don't think I particularly cared. Over time, the more I got to know Damon, the more I sometimes wish we hadn't met. It wasn't that he was a bad person or hurtful, but he reminded me of myself, the person I was trying to escape. I could have been coerced into marriage and lived a miserable existence too. I would later find out the wife of convenience he spoke of was fully aware of his sexuality, but was desperately trying to save their marriage with the help of Jesus and the church. Frankly, his world confused me. One day sex with me, the next day, he's confessing his sins to his pastor at church where he was also a deacon. It saddened me that Dan was desperately trying to do the right thing, <coughs> but he was always falling short in the eyes of his faith. My time in Alaska felt like a prison sentence at times. There were people in my life, but most, with the exception of Damon, felt like acquaintances. None of them really knew me because I didn't allow them to. To survive, I had to live under the radar. It was like three years of solitary confinement. About three years, or excuse me, about three months before my separation, I was on the telephone speaking with my mother when she broached the subject of my separation. So after three months, you're done, she asked, you can come home. I don't know when I made the decision not to return to Cleveland. Over my enlistment, the more time I spent away, the less connected I felt to my place of birth. I landed the job with Homeland Security in 2002 upon my separation from the Air Force and re relocated to San Diego. Shortly after I moved, my brother called me while I was driving to work. His voice was heavy. I found her, he said. She was home alone. I found her in this, this morning. What are you talking about? Mom, he said, she's gone. I looked around, surrounded by cars and unable to move. I thought of my mother alone with no one there, and it seemed unfair to me. Living in California, away from home, suddenly felt like a selfish act. I thought about the last conversation I had with my mom. Hey, do you remember that saxophone solo you had in 11th grade, she asked. I don't know why she would bring up something so random and so long ago, but I said that I did. I was proud of you, she said, and I still am. She would pass away two days later. I wonder if this was her last gift to me, releasing her firstborn from the torment and confusion she knew I battled with and maybe she indirectly contributed to. I knew through it all that she was only one of the best for me. Mistakes were made, but I knew she did her best. 
Perhaps she needed to be cleansed of her faults and misgivings. Whatever the reasons, I think we both were set free. Derek Woodford. Our next performer was introduced to me when she was selected as one of eight out of hundreds, I think, at City, San Diego City College Vamps Showcase two semesters ago. Uh, she'll be in our future incoming showcases. And so please welcome my friend, Sage Foley. part of my bicep is stunned by the strength of his fingers. He guides me. The space is tight. Restricting our movements. The door is closed, gently. The tiny space beginning to morph into a closet, squeezing our tense energies, forcing them against each other. I know, he said. Authority and disgust dripping from his vocal cords. She flirts with you in broad daylight. She grabs her hips in the hallways of my surgical department. This is my fucking department, Foley. You seem to be very confused about that, so I'm going to clear it up for you. His head lowers, his eyes at my chin, cocks his head provokingly. Are you listening? Fucking pay attention. How you choose to walk away with this information will determine the outcome of the future. A few words to the right people, and I can throw you off this island with a dishonorable discharge. Are you scared? Because you fucking should be. My throat tightens. My heart clings to the edges of my rib cage, wraps its bloody hands around the bars, and hangs on for dear life. I'm shutting down. No, fuck, no, not now, please, not now. Don't let him have this. This is yours. This is precious. He is dangerous. I swallow the dark. It's thick. It would much prefer to swallow me. Wrap me up, protect me. It knows when it needs to. I find the center of his eyes and lock into the darkest part of his pupils. His spirit trembles. I hold it steady. Who taught you fear? I ask gently. Who taught you that you aren't supposed to pay car loans with hand jobs? I frighten him. His spirit shakes violently. I let it. I taught myself. You know nothing to fear, Captain. Don't challenge mine. I've wrecked his concentration, shaken his perception. I can see it in the confusion draping over his eyes. He's gone blind, deaf. All noises I emit are drowned by the only thing that he can hear. Pride. I've wounded him. I intended to. He refocuses, readjusts, scrambles for control, finds it in my weak spot. Okay. Well, here are the facts, fully. He puts his palms on, the shoulders, on my shoulders and in one effortless push, seats me. He wants me looking up. Instead, I stare straight into his belt buckle, the USNS Mercy. I know that ship well. It rocked my aching empathy to sleep for five months. It's comforting, even if it is hugging his hips. His hips. How frustrated they must be carry the weight of such an unkind spirit. Look at me fully, control. He's aching for it. I don't flinch. I'm sure I would if I could, but I have a very protective spirit, and this time she's winning. I can't move. Okay, bitch. I'll just talk to your forehead then. I know you're fucking her. Every single fucking person in the OR knows that you're fucking her. You're an HN, and she is your superior officer. Since you seem to care very little for your own well-being, I'll speak in a language that you do understand. You are not the only one at risk here. She's a successful surgeon, and I assume she's worked hard to be what she is. I can take that all away from her. I can take everything away from her. Keep that in mind. Every time you strut these holes like you own the place, every time you let her touch you in the company of your peers, I'll give him that. Touching me in public was not the best idea she's ever had. She was wonderfully bold. She knew no bounds, only humanity. She was an extraordinary human. 
out, out, get out. Now, my lungs are collapsing, my body is trembling. He got me. He knows it. It's radiating off the smirk, stretching his lips to meet his right cheekbone. Out. I stand up and rush out of the room, standing in the hole, shutting off, turning down further, deeper. Foley, I'm not done with you. Get the fuck back in here. He follows, meets me in the hole. All of my coworkers are locked on to our display of this inhumane tendencies. Most of them can't see it, blinded by the silver eagle spreading its metallic wings over this man's collarbone. But he's just a man, a man with a fancy pen. Get out of tension, each and fully. Get the fuck out of tension. My knees give way, and I feel the wool sliding at my back. I'm curling fetal on the floor. Stop shaking. He doesn't deserve this. Stop shaking. My intents are fuel. My mother taught me to defend all too well. What is your problem? Get off the floor, fully. That is an order. The fox have been temporary, temporarily removed from his diction. He's aware of his publicity. You're done, Captain. You're done. My nurse calls out from down the hall. She's just stepped up from surgery, still masked in love, practically running towards me. You are done, she demands, in a boldness of tone that only defense can provoke. I am loved. He is outnumbered. Tears are welling in her beautiful eyes. She folds her body over me. Easy, kiddo. You're okay. I don't understand. What are you doing? People don't cry for me. People don't protect me. People don't. She didn't know anything. I never let her in, my surgeon. I never told her about him. Protecting her was my only priority. I knock on her office door softly. She brought up a meekness in me. I love that about her. It's open, she announced from behind her desk. Her throne, she was powerful. I should have given her the chance to defend herself. It would have hurt her less. She looked up from Charlie and smiled confidently. She understood happiness well. She taught me a lot of it. She taught me how to feel the ocean floor. I met her smile, fell into her space. She caught me. Hey, Foley, wanna be fucked? No, no, I can't have her, I can't hurt her, I can't. Tell her everything, leave her safe, leave her. My lips are the only thing that find emotion. Yes, please fuck me. Tears are begging my eyes, they want to drip onto her naked skin. She stands, moves towards me, pushes me into the wall when her emotion finds my stillness. They want to hurt us. My conscience pleads with her. Her spirit won't hear of it in her hands. Are on a mission. She must have me. I must be taken. She grips the back of my neck and pulls me closer, closer. My body begs her to take her blade and run it from my breast to my navel, stretch my ribs just enough for her to crawl inside. Closer. She pulls the drawstrings of my scrubs and reaches for me. Her spirit cradles mine, and my tears have their way. She pulls back. Did I hurt you fully? What's wrong? Fuck, what did I do? I'm past the hope of explanation. I have no words, only pain. I've decided I will not tell her. The silent hero. I know everything. I know nothing. I am no hero. Uh, long day. I whimper. I grab her waist and push her towards her desk. My attempt at aggression motions to reassure her desire. I needed her. I thought she needed me. Her perception of my worth had me conceded. With one quick brush of my forearm and zero deliberation, I managed to clear about a fourth of her desk. Papers scattered on the ground, important patient privacy kind of papers. Foley, she caught my arm. That is it. That's a terrible idea, she said in a, a composure only she could carry, a full smile only she could muster in disapproval. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I choked on a disappointed giggle. I saw it in a movie once. <laughs> Intensely misleading. I got on my hands and knees and started compiling my frantic display of desire. She came behind me, took hold of my hips, and pushed my face into the paper stained carpet, kissing a prescription for antibiotics. I heard her whisper, Leave it. I left it. I left it all. That was the last time I snuck away to her office. The last time I rested the palm, my palm on the back of her gloved hand as she reached back blindly to grab an instrument off my table. The last bike ride through the clay playground of Guam's south end. The last dive, sharing her energy with the depths of the Asian Pacific. Now, when I caught her glance, it was only pain that I saw. Confusion and pain. But it was never cold and never cool. I had yet to learn the value of that magnificent human quality. She was kind. She was a surgeon, I mean, captain, my superior or something or another, but mostly and completely, she was kind. And I was weak, taken by the wrong hands, controlled by the wrong voices, stuck in a system that assigns power with the same authority and takes it away. None. A system that promotes disassociation from humanity. The disassociation is acceptable if the humans are uniformed. It's not wrong if we all look the same. It's not wrong if we're all doing it. Sage Foley. Our final performer of the evening. He is a man who has given a lot to me and to Sissy. We all, if you come to our Green Room Writers Workshop, uh, there's a very good chance you might find him leading it because that's what he does. He's a leader. And besides being an amazing writer, uh, he's a guy whose friendship I really strive to deserve every day. So without further ado, Captain Francisco Martinez Galeo. You're too kind and too tall. <laughs> Presence. <laughs> I don't even know where to put this. All right. The zygomatic is major and minor muscles, or better known as the smiling muscles. I first noticed my zygomatic is muscles atrophy in October 2015, while I was at Avon's in San Diego, when the front swiveling wheels of my shopping cart seized up. The shopping cart was invented by Sylvan Goldman of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Sylvan sat in his office one night in 1936 and wondered how he could get his customers to move more groceries. And yet, I was stuck in aisle 13 at the supermarket, not moving shit. <laughs> the increase in static friction forced my back to round and head to dip while I shortened my steps, still unable to move an empty 35-pound aluminum vessel. My 13-year-old twins, amused with my struggle, offered comic relief by making faces at me as I kicked and whispered expletives at the winning wheel. I scratched my left wrist and adjusted my memorial bracelet that I had purchased in February 2004, while Tobiah, the eldest by two minutes, held a jar of sm Smucker's apple butter. What you got there, Buck? I asked in between pushes and grunts. What do people use this for? She raised the jar in a synchronized fashion. I can't read the jar. I squinted. I scratched my hairy face. I hate Scruffy's dad. Nayoka, the younger twin, smirked, referring to my failed attempt at bearding. <laughs> my zygomaticus muscles did not respond. My father hadn't been in my life since I was three and my parents divorced. I cannot comprehend what it's like to have a father, let alone a life of a Marine veteran who missed years of his children's lives. My daughters were on a repetitive seven-stage emotional cycle of deployment. This cycle included anticipation of loss, detachment and withdrawal, emotional disorganization, recovery and stabilization, anticipation of homecoming, re renegotiation of marriage, and reintegration and stabilization. Stage one, anticipation of loss came to me when I was sitting in the transition assistance program classes that separating service members receive. 
I had received my DD-214 and officially retired from the Marine Corps in September 2015, and my mind was going through this seven-stage cycle for the third time. The first time was during my year-long stay in Iraq, 2008. The second was Afghanistan, 2011. And now, I was deploying from the Marine Corps. My twins stared at their stage two detached and withdrawn father, a man foreign to them, bound by blood, who made them uneasy, but whom they mimicked and teased to alleviate tense situations. They called me names like Beardo in order to get a response from my expressionless face. In the Marines, we are taught to compartmentalize our emotions and not allow them to interfere with the decision-making process. Emotions cause hesitation, which leads to loss of life. But when my daughters would hesitate kissing me goodnight as if they were smooching a porcupine, I'd be lying if I said it didn't bother me. Smucker's butter, Smucker's apple butter, I said. I used to know someone who loved this stuff. Tell me a story, Dad. At that particular moment, it was hard to tell if my daughter came up with that phrase organic, organically or if she was mimicking me again. Tell me a story transported me back to a world when my zygomaticus major and mitre were flexible and strong, undefeated against sadness and anger. March 2000, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I was a young enlisted man, a sergeant, and a marine security guard at the American Council in Rio de Janeiro. I was the new guy, and my immediate supervisor had just returned from Bahia, Brazil. His name was then Kyle Seitzinger, but he preferred Kyle for short. Kyle felt it appropriate that FNGs, fucking new guys, work all the holiday shifts so that the senior members of the team could enjoy life. I had transferred from Kampala, Uganda, flying from one continent to another, a long flight that caused my short temper to flare, then landed on the eve of Carnival, only to go to work the next morning. After three days of shift work, I relaxed in the empty marine house. I was watching TV when Kyle walked in through the front door. A hairy, barrel-chested man in a black Speedo, he shouted, Tell me a story! <laughs> I'll tell you a story, I responded. I'll tell you a story about a sergeant who screwed over another sergeant by making him work before he even had a chance to acclimate to a new environment. Kyle laughed. It's carnival, son. We don't have time for that. <laughs> While my initial reaction towards Kyle wasn't positive, his gregariousness won me over enough to shed tears when his tour ended and he was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps after six and a half years. Kyle was an infantryman by trade, but he didn't spend much time with the line company as a result of his successes on the rifle range. He was an instrument of war, and he dutifully mastered his craft with precision so much that he became a coveted rifle range coach at Edson Rage aboard Camp Pendleton. Kyle was born on October 4, 1974, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma a place I would curse much later in life for giving birth to the shopping cart. <laughs> Throughout his life, Kyle moved with purpose and speed as if instinctively driven to explore this world. Kyle finds service and sacrifice early through simple gestures like giving his jacket to the cold poor kid in school. Now, he wasn't a saint. He was flawed like all teenage boys. His lack of discipline and disdain for authority resulted in his enrollment at the Wentworth Military Academy in nearby Lexington, Missouri. Later in Rio, Kyle would receive care packages from his community, church, and family. The contents of the care packages often included children's clothes, soccer, soccer balls, and Smucker's apple butter. Kyle presented the children's clothes to the orphaned and impoverished children of Rio. He threw soccer balls to the kids on the street from the armored vehicle on his way to work and he routinely smeared the apple butter on toast or shoved spoonfuls into his mouth every morning and washed it down with coffee. Put the jar in the cart. I'll tell you a story after some toast. After she put the jar in the cart, I pushed it with ease, as if the apple butter greased the stuck swivel wheels. We finished shopping and returned home. In early February 2004, I received a phone call from then Staff Sergeant William Pennington, William was stationed with me and Kyle in Brazil, and we continued our friendship. My girlfriend, Tasha, who would later become my wife, answered the phone. I was bottle feeding to Vaya while watching TV. I always admired Tasha's olive complexion, but moments after picking up the phone, I noticed her skin had turned pale. You need to take this call, she said. It's William. I exchanged Vaya for the phone. What's up, Pennington? Kyle's dead, Frank. 
he was blown up. After the Marines, Kyle went to Oklahoma Christian University in pursuit of a degree in both journalism and Spanish. He also went into the Army Reserves as a way to help pay for school. He was on his way to graduating, but he was called to active duty in November 2003 with the 486th Civil Affairs Battalion out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Back from the store, the twins put, put away the groceries while I placed four slices of bread in their respective spring-loaded trays of my automatic toaster, and I triggered the lowering mechanism. I opened up the jar of apple butter, imagining Kyle opening a care package. On January 29, 2004, the United States sustained the largest loss of life in Afghanistan at the time. The Army said a weapons cache exploded in Afghanistan and never explained anything more to the eight families that were 7,400 miles away. Those families absorbed the shock waves and were fragmented that cold Thursday in January. The Army didn't have to tell me a story. I already knew Kyle's. I'm positive Kyle went on patrol with his care package and handed out clothes, toys, and chocolate to the Afghan kids. I'm positive the children were being watched by others, just as I watched the orange toaster coils glow. I'm positive the kids felt fed Kyle information and Kyle acted on it. My automatic toaster radiated 310 degrees of heat on that bread as I was trying to comprehend the effects of 3,000 degree heat on flesh the toaster popped, the image vaporized. Paper plates, Dad? Yes. I felt the girl's stares as I grabbed the toast slowly and sat it on three plates. One for each of them, and two for me. I'll get a butter knife, said one. I'll get milk, said the other. I'll be at the table. I grabbed the apple butter along with the toast. Moments later, we all sat down. I began to tell them a story about apple butter and how it used to be a family and community effort to make. I told them that apple butter would last through harsh winters and communities would make it and hold, hold festivals in October. I paused the story, took the knife to the apple butter with my right hand as I held the toast on my left when I thought of Ghazni, Afghanistan, where Kyle took his last breath. The capital of Ghazni is at the foot of the Hindu Kush mountains, roughly 7,300 feet above sea level. I elevated my left wrist where the starchy plateau lay flat in my palm, my bracelet in my line of sight. I smeared the deep brown apple butter over the caramelized toast like an explosion coating its path with shrapnel and soot. Are you okay, Dad? No. No, I'm not. I entered stage three emotional disorganization when I took a bite of the toast. I was surprised by the sweetness of the apple butter, but it didn't ameliorate the bitterness. I was angry at Kyle for not seeing my daughters or me before he left. I was mad at him for answering the call to serve again when he'd already done his time. I felt guilty for surviving about after 20 years of service and he had been denied his dreams. I was so occupied with anger, I was oblivious to notice that the twins had dismissed themselves to their room. It put me in timeout. While in timeout, I thought more about why Kyle continued his service. I think he missed the sense of purpose and brotherhood that came with it. I missed it too, so I applied to the San Diego Police Department. I was scheduled to attend the academy in November. I had an appointment with a psychiatrist on the morning of October 22nd, 2015. At the psychiatrist's office, I took the battery of tests and waited for the interview. The psychiatrist went into the waiting area where we exchanged greetings. As she led me down the hallway to her office, a volley of questions came out of her like a three-round burst from a service rifle. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you okay? Why do you look so sad? When we got into her office, she sat down at her desk as I sat in a chair in front of her. I told her a story about being born in the Dominican Republic and raised in Long Island, New York, oftentimes being the only family of color in the neighborhood. She folded her arms like my mother did when she was dissatisfied with me and not buying my bullshit. I moved past my demographics and continued. I told her more stories about eating government cheese and purchasing food with food stamps or monopoly money, as the bullies refer to. I told her a story of depression after Kyle's death, to which her response was, 
you had a tough life. She asked if I had flashbacks and I told her about my experiences. She asked me why I wanted to be a police officer. I told her that I saw a purpose and I wanted to serve my community. She recommended I find another profession. I was a liability and considered a high risk for the department. After a few weeks after my visit with the psychiatrist, I drove up to San Clemente where Kyle's family dedicated a bench in honor of him at the Marine Monument in Semper Fi Park. There's a beautiful view of the San Clemente Pier being swallowed by the Pacific. I sat on Kyle's bench that foggy fall morning. I was slumped over with my head in my hands, rubbing my hair back and forth in frustration. I whispered, I'm trying. When my bracelet scratched my forehead, I took off the bracelet and studied it for the first time. It was scratched by Babylonian sandstorms and battered by the Afghan metamorphic rock, but you can still make out the engraved print. Sergeant Dan Kyle Seitzinger, OK Army, Enduring Freedom, KIA, 29 Jan, 04. I got off the bench to throw the bracelet when I noticed the fog had lifted and I could see the beard clearly to the left of beach swings. I remembered a day in March in 2011 when I took the twins to meet with William before I deployed to Afghanistan. William and I exchanged stories about Kyle that day. My daughters asked me and William to walk the pier and try out the beach swings, so we did. I pushed the girls on their swing, their backs crashed against my hand like Newton's cradle. Their blonde locks danced with the onshore breeze as their bodies defied gravity. Higher, Daddy, higher, they demanded until they were parallel with the heavens. Their zygomaticus muscles active, present, and accounted for. At that moment, I could feel Kyle's presence. He was there that spring 2011, just as he was in November 2015. And for that moment, all of us were together again. This realization welcomed me into stage four, recovery and stabilization, and I felt my facial nerve trigger the zygomaticus minor to draw my upper lip up, igniting a chain reaction. My cranial nerve fired signals to the zygomaticus major, and I felt the corners begin to turn. I got into my car and returned home. Francisco Martinez Correo. And that is our show. All of your performance one more time is Allison Gale, Joshua Calloway, Jim Ruland, Derek Woodford, Sage Foley, and Frank. Uh, I think we got a raffle, Jim, is that right? For the giving away the incoming books. Turn it over to you really quick. Yeah. And while you're hustling up to the microphone. So please do grab that fly. It will literally take any interpretation you have on the theme of Sex Groups in Copenhagen for our next book. We can't wait to read them. Uh, and thanks so much. Here's Jim.